Now we are well along in our study of the book of Revelation, having arrived at the last three chapters, chapter 20, 21, 22. The horrors of the tribulation are past. Our study of the great uh, negative truths the warily. And now we come to the golden age of mankind, astrologists, and spoken of by the Greek philosophers. We come to the perfect age of mankind, which man longs to bring in. And this is the golden age of Pericles, the Republic of Plato, the 1,000-year Reich, Third Reich of Adolf Hitler. And, of course, this is God's fulfillment of the dream dreamt by Darwin and Martin Luther King, Jr. Of course, the Holy Spirit's version of Luther Luther King had a dream, and the writer of Jeremiah tells us that the prophet that had the dream, let him speak a dream, what's the chaff to the wheat, is not my word like a hammer. Martin Luther King, Jr.'s dream of a great passive mongrel uh, United Nations doesn't come to pass. If it comes to pass at all, it is fulfilled in the tribulation under the Antichrist. You may notice our remarks on the leopard from Revelation chapter 13, 1 to 2. Darwin's great dream of man's uh, pilgrim to progress, pilgrim's progress, puddle to paradise, ever upward and onward to a final stage where humanity realizes itself and is proud to be called man, to quote Franklin Delano Roosevelt, never comes to pass. As a matter of fact, every plan of man in the realm of sociology, psychology, physiology, geopolitics, and religion is turned into a desolation. And less than 24 hours after Jesus Christ arrives, men learn that the answer is a sinless, holy creator ruling and reigning over their individual lives, and religion have absolutely nothing to offer at all. And the total result of the work of unregenerate man for 19 centuries is nullified and made nugatory in less than 24 hours. After all, the issue was spiritual to start with, and the findings of physical science couldn't have affected it one way or another. Revelation chapter 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Nor are we left in any doubt about what these things mean. If the Bible is symbolic or figurative at all, or speaks in symbols, it is careful to tell us what the symbol refers to. For example, we are referred to chains of darkness, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. We are referred to the key of David in uh, Revelation chapter 3. There are all kinds of keys, there are all kinds of chains. And since the Bible is its own dictionary and its own interpreter, we never have to rely on the depraved guesses of church politicians and Greek scholars for the correct meaning of the words. This is plainly an unusual type of chain and an unusual type of key. The bottomless pit we have discussed before in our comments in Revelation 9. And he laid hold on the dragon. We've discussed him in detail in our comments under Revelation 12. That old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. This brings in what we call the mill annum, the millennium. There are three beliefs in regard to the mill annum, the millennium. The first of these is called post-millennialism. Post-millennialism is the teaching that man is gradually evolving up from an amoeba and by availing himself of the sacraments and the findings of science and education, he can gradually make the earth a better place to live upon and by balancing the economic system and leveling classes to a common mongrel denominator, he can bring in peace on earth and a thousand years of perfect peace before Jesus Christ comes back. This is a belief of Christians called post-millennialism. Of course, Darwin and Huxley and Marx didn't count on Jesus Christ as a deciding factor or even a, a calculated risk. But if a man's a Christian and a post-millennialist, that's what he believes. The creed of the post-millennialist is stated best in the Southern Baptist Convention pamphlet called the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. And if you have a copy of that, you may look under the article called The Kingdom of God. And you'll see immediately that the official creed of the Southern Baptist Convention is post-millennialism. Ubiquity, and it is the philosophical system of Plato and Augustine who wrote The City of God. And it is just about as close to the biblical truth as a used car lot resembles a rose garden. There were many, many Christians who were post-millennialists until World War I. World War I kind of knocked the props out of the Darwinian evolutionists for a while. Of course, they recovered. Their ability to recover is remarkable because of their faith. 
Uh, an evolutionist must have much more faith than a Bible-believing Christian. And the faith of evolutionists to believe in evolution in spite of evidence is of the 20th century. It's really remarkable, if not downright fantastic, to quote the current expression. Uh, it's a fantasy. And so the post millennialists kind of had the post taken away from them after the Battle of the Marne and the Argonne Forest and the Treaty of Versailles. And so they became what we call our millennialists. And our millennialist is a person who simply doesn't believe there's going to be any thousand year reign of Christ. Instead of saying that man's going to bring in a peaceful kingdom for a thousand years and then Christ shall return, the our millennialist simply looks for things to get better or worse depending upon the point of view. And then the Lord suddenly comes back and blows everything up and the white throne judgment takes place. The leading our millennialist of the centuries, of course, was John Calvin and the Presbyterian theologians Warfield, J. Gresham Machen, Macon, or Machen, whatever you want to call him, and others followed this our millennial system. Robert Dick Wilson, a great conservative Orthodox Christian and a master of more than 26 languages, never knew enough Bible to get it straightened out and is quite characteristic of the geniuses and the linguists and etymologists such as Franz Delitzsch and Jacinius, Kyle, Lightfoot, Westcott and Hort, Ellicott, Trench, Vincent, and the men who wrote the Greek lexicons. It's quite uh, SOP, standard operating procedure, for these men to be incapable of understanding the Word of God. So nearly all of them are post-millennial or are millennial. And our millennialist simply believes a thousand years spoken of here in our context are figurative and represent, quote, an indefinite period of time. The fact that the expression is used six times, verse 2, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, the fact that the expression is used six times without a single variation means absolutely nothing to the amillennial Bible rejecter at all. Most of the reformers were amillennialists. And those who weren't were post-millennialists. There were a few pre-millennialists in the group. And, of course, there's no time to go into that now. But if you'll obtain a copy of the written copy of the Bible Believer's Commentary and Revelation, you'll find in the introduction, the preface, the history of premillennialism given. Now, what is a premillennialist? A premillennialist is a man that believes that Darwin was full of beans, that Aldous Huxley was full of baloney, and that Haeckel and Lamarck were stuffed full of demons up to the ears. That is, a premillennialist is a realist. A premillennialist is a man that believes there's going to be de de degeneration, devolution, and disintegration, moral, social, and economic chaos, with the world and falling apart, and only able to unite itself under a man from outer space who will be the devil incarnate and that following this degeneration and catastrophe, Jesus Christ himself will return, and there will be absolutely no peace on this earth whatsoever until the Prince of Peace comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and fulfills the promise given to him at his birth, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The reading toward men of goodwill in the corrupt New American Standard Version is a copy of the Dewey Reams Roman Catholic Vulgate of 1582. And you're not to believe it for a minute. The Bible of 1582 was a Dark Age Bible put out by Jesuit priests, and the fact that the American Standard Version copies the reading means nothing except the men who recommend the American Standard Version are either remarkably ignorant or remarkably crooked, or perhaps both. And when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he'll set up a 1,000-year reign. Now, this is the pre-millennial system. Every leading soul winner from 1900 to the present recording is a pre-millennialist. The world has not seen one post-millennial or amillennial revivalist or evangelistic soul winner since the turn of the century. And with the exception of a few holdovers like B.H. Carroll, and Scarborough. They all died out in World War I. No man who takes the same Christian approach to the Scripture could possibly believe the theory of evolution applies to man's moral and spiritual progress. If there's one thing the Bible teaches from kiver to kiver, as they say up in North Carolina, 
It teaches that man is hopeless unless God haps him. You hap him in North Carolina, you hope him in Kentucky and Missouri, and you hep him if you're from Alabama and Mississippi, and you help them if you're from Colorado or Kansas. But unless God helps them, they go to pieces. The book of Judges is an historic record of this great moral truth, the great law of human collapse. Every dispensation of the Bible ends with apostasy, and the one you're living in is no exception. The premillennial view, therefore, is the realistic view. It is the view of the realist who prepares himself for battle, who arms himself with the teeth, and doesn't pay any attention at all to anybody's blather about peace on earth. There isn't going to be any till the king of priests and the prince of priests, the king of glory and the lord of lords returns, and until that time, in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. Revelation 20, verse 3 and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more. Of course, this puts the post millennialist and the arm millennialist in a ridiculous position. And the only way they can get out is talk about Christ binding the devil's power at Calvary, and overcoming the principalities and powers, Colossians 2, and leading death and hell captive, Ephesians chapter 4. And of course, all of this is just blithering nonsense. The captives led captive in Ephesians chapter 4 were Old Testament saints in paradise, not death and hell. When Christ had the keys of death and hell around his girdle, he had control of death and hell. He didn't capture either because death is still here and the last enemy to be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15 is death and it is no more destroyed until the end of the millennium than garbage and cancer. Therefore, the spiritualization tendencies, spiritualizing tendencies of the amillennial and postmillennial exegetes and expositors is uh, phenomenal in its uh, fantastic ravings. Nothing could be any further from the truth if you tried. And Christ conquering the devil, his triumph over the devil, was plainly a spiritual victory in Colossians chapter 2, which is apparent by the context. If you think the devil was chained and shut up at Calvary, you ought to go down and see a head shrinker. Like an old saint said when a post millennialist talked to her, she said, well, if the devil's bound, you mean he's bound now and he's been bound since the resurrection of Christ? And the post millennialist said, yes. And she said, well, he sure do have a long chain. And there's, a lot, there's more truth in fiction than that, brother. That isn't just a smart saying, you know, like, the King James Bible is good enough for Paul and Silas and it's good enough for me. You know, that old hackneyed cliche used by these Bible perverts. No, that, there's a lot of truth in that. If he's bound with a chain, he sure has a leash on him, doesn't he? He sure has some slack. No, the post millennial systems and our millennial systems are obviously attempts by Satan himself to overthrow the Word of God. The devil's not bound. He's on the loose. Simon Peter says he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he walks to and fro in this earth, brother, in the book of Job before the crucifixion and after the resurrection in 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you think he's bound, you ought to have your head looked at. What do you think the instructions are in Ephesians 6 for spiritual warfare if your adversary is chained? Your adversary is not chained, but he's going to be. And then he said, he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be loosed, and after that he must be loosed a little season. This loosing takes place in verse 7, 8, and 9. And it's one of the wonders of the Bible and one of the great uh, mysteries which causes many people to reject the literal account of the book of Revelation. They say, well, it just, just doesn't make sense. Years ago in Alexandria, Egypt, at the great apostate dead orthodox school, the great educational institution that had a reputation of being fundamental because it stood by the fun fundamentals of the faith, there was a demon-possessed scholar named Origen. And Origen, of course, uh, invented the text from which the American Standard Version is taken and the New American Standard Version. And this Origen had a ha habit he followed, uh, which may be stated thusly. If it doesn't make sense and it isn't reasonable, there has been a corruption of the text. And on this basis, Origen altered the text in hundreds of places. I don't know whether you know it or not, but there are more than 5,000 changes in the Greek text of the King James Bible and the New American Standard Version. 
The New American Standard Version of 1960 is a reproduction of Jerome's Latin Vulgate from 1582, preserved in the Reims edition. And if you get a copy of this, you'll see it. And throughout this Bible, so-called, you will find wherever it didn't make sense to the translator, he simply changed the reading. Now, here we have a case. People say, well, why would the Lord allow the devil to come out again and mess up everybody after he's been defeated and put in the bottomless pit for a thousand years? But you see, these type of questions come from a shallow mind that is not seeking truth. These questions are the questions that come from a mind that has been trained in casuistry and sophistry, a mind that has not been trained in sincerity and deep meditation. Any man who meditated deeply on the problem and sought an answer from the Scripture would understand perfectly why the devil is loosed. You see, for centuries, men have been blaming things on the devil. Now we realize, of course, you have a certain type of uh, materialist, a certain type of uh, social evolutionist who doesn't recognize the presence of the devil, but many of the educated people from this class are now Satan worshipers. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but all the leaders in the movement out in California that are Satanists are PhDs, and every one of them was an evolutionary materialist in the college where he taught. That is the obvious reaction against a gross materialism and evolutionism, which uh, is prevalent in Russia, is Satanism. Man has to have an authority, he has to have some spiritual authority, and if he won't take the right one, he'll invent one or get the wrong one. So for years, men have been blaming things as the devil. The devil has a point. Don't you think for a minute that he's not brilliant? Don't you think for a minute that he's not rational? In our studies in Revelation chapter 12, we learn that outside of the Trinity, he was the most powerful, intelligent personage in the entire universe, and not even the Lord Jesus Christ could rebuke the devil before the Incarnation. You may review those marks in the volume that deals with Revelation 12, verse 3 to 8. Now, this personage has his point before the judge advocate, and his point is this. These men have blamed this on me, they blame that on me. Why, if you took me off the scene where I couldn't tempt them and couldn't work on them, they'd still mess up. And on this point, the devil is right. His grounds of argument are legal and correct. With Satan gone off the face of this earth, with the unclean spirits removed from the land, see Zechariah 9, 10, 11, and 12, man's depraved Adamic nature still causes him to reject Christ, Isaiah chapter 26, resent Christ, Psalm 110, and refuse to worship Christ, Zechariah chapter 14. On this earth surviving the tribulation are hundreds of people who escaped in holes and caves and rocks and escaped the mark of the beast and at the same time were not converted to Jesus Christ. They go into the tribulation and then on into the millennium. Also on this earth, according to Daniel chapter 11, are countries that get through the wrath of Satan without being caught and being converted. And then in addition to these, we have the blessed of my Father inheriting the kingdom prepared from them, for them from the foundation of the world, Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. And when these come into the millennium, they bear children, Isaiah chapter 65. These children grow up, grow up and have other children. So in the millennium, you have two or three generations coming up that still have the inheritance of Adam, the Adamic nature. Since there is no such thing as a new birth after the rapture, and review our marks from the Holy Spirit back in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, since there is no such thing as an indwelling Christ spiritually circumcised in the soul from the body in the millennium, these people grow up obeying Christ only as a matter of form, ritual, and regulation. The regulations under which they live are found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which see. And notice again, how remarkably, again, how remarkably the Holy Spirit has placed the verses so that if a man rejects salvation by grace through faith, he automatically picks the salvation by works passages that are for people in the millennium. As we have commented before in our comments on uh, Revelation chapter 
12 and Revelation chapter 14, the combination of faith and works found in the tribulation is reduced to works in the millennium. And no reader of Matthew 25 and Matthew 5, 6, and 7 could ever confound that plan of salvation with the one given in Ephesians 2, Galatians 1, and Romans 3, 4, and 5. It is a works situation. With the devil gone and man living entirely under the law, works. Read them. Study them. They're in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount gives the constitution for the literal, physical, visible, Davidic, messianic kingdom. And they're the reason why the Seventh-day Adventists picked the passage in Matthew 5 and why the Catholics picked the Our Father out of Matthew 6 and the reason why the liberal picked the blessed are the blessed this and the blessed that out of Matthew chapter 5 is because these people, like all grace-rejecting, grace-denying, grace-hating, self-righteous, God-defying, salvation-rejecting sinners want a plan of salvation in which they have a part. In the millennium, you'll have a part. Matter of fact, you'll have the part, the whole part, nothing but the part. In the millennium, if you may call a man a fool, you're in danger of judgment, brother. You're in danger of going to hell if you call a man a fool in the millennium. Didn't you ever read Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Didn't you ever notice that was given to Jewish disciples? Did you ever notice that no Christians are present? Didn't you ever notice the plan of salvation is not in the passage? Didn't you notice that blood atonement is not mentioned except in the altar at Jerusalem like it will be in the millennium in Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48? Haven't you studied yet to show yourself approved unto God, a workman needed right not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? So the devil's point is man is inherently corrupt and he'll fail even without me around. And it's true, he does. With a glorified, risen Savior on hand as King and Lord of Lords, with an earth blossoming and flowering out into vegetation like the world has never seen, with the light of the sun and moon increased seven times, man is still a rebel. Here on this regenerated earth, Matthew chapter 19, where the restitution of all things has taken place, Acts chapter to live together in peace and harmony, Isaiah chapter 11, man still resents a holy, sinless being who is superior to him. And at the end of the millennium, men rebel. They rebel. Now returning again to the millennium itself and the nature of this reign. In verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ. You will notice it is not an indefinite period of time. It is 1,000 years. You will notice they are seated on thrones, plural. They are not in heaven. You will notice they are seated on the ground, on the earth, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 40, you will notice throughout everywhere it is always speaking of a literal, physical, visible, politic kingdom on the ground. Not once is there any reference at all to heavenly reign. They lived and reigned with Christ. It doesn't say they died and went up there in glory and reigned. They lived and reigned. And Paul says if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And Paul says, if we suffer with him, we're heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Someday we get this millennial inheritance, and the Holy Spirit leads us to no doubt at all as to the nature of this inheritance. For he says in Colossians, knowing of the Lord Jesus, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Unlike salvation, which is by grace through faith, the millennial inheritance is an earned reward that is earned by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall study the nature of this servitude, the nature of this reward, and the nature of this reign on the reverse side of this record, side two of this volume, dealing with the millennial reign of Christ in Revelation chapter 20 at verse 4. A study of Revelation chapter 20, dealing with the millennial reign of Christ. 
And, of course, this word millennium comes from the Latin mill annum, 1,000 years. And on the reverse side of this record, we have discussed in detail the three views of the millennial kingdom, the post-millennial view, the amillennial view, and the pre-millennial view. And, of course, that is the issue in America today. I say it's the issue. It's not the uh, ultimate issue. The ultimate issue in America today among God's people is the authority of the word. And when the average conservative speaks of the authority of the word, he is referring to a mythological book that he doesn't have, that nobody's ever seen, and to which he has no access. When we speak about the authority of the word, we are speaking of the Bible we have in our hand. Next to this issue, the issue of the infallible authority of God's word, is the issue of the second coming of Christ. And the reason for this is we're living in the last quarter of the last half of the world's history before the advent. And so this issue becomes a crucial one. It becomes especially crucial in view of the fact that communism is an evolutionary system that teaches progress by revolution and automatic progress by conflict. Of course, the Bible picture is automatic degeneration whether you conflict or not. And therefore, the second coming of Christ is not merely a religious issue. It is a social and political issue. And this makes it very appropriate for our time, or as the country folks say, very timely. We read in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that two class of people reign with Christ. We read about the people sitting and reigning with Christ, spoken of in Matthew 19, 25, like the twelve apostles. We, of course, uh, read about the reigning of people with Christ, like the Christians do from the church age who suffer with Christ. For Paul says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And then we read about the tribulation saints reigning. Notice the colon after the word them, and the second group follows, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Now these people were decapitated, as we discussed in our exposition of Revelation 6. And at that time, in discussing Revelation 6, the souls under the altar, and at the time we expounded Revelation chapter 11, verse 4 to verse 10, I called your attention to the fact that the method of capital punishment used in the tribulation is decapitation. And so we read here, they were beheaded. They had their heads cut off for not taking the mark of the beast. And they live and reign with Christ. Now, if there's any doubt in the student's mind about this literal reign, he should ve give very careful attention to the material found in Luke chapter 19. For here we are told in no uncertain terms that this reign has to be on earth. For the people who reign do not reign over New Jerusalem, nor do they reign in heaven. They reign over literal cities. You will notice in Luke chapter 19, when Christ returns, having received the kingdom, verse 12, that his Christ-rejecting citizens, verse 14, who didn't want him to reign over them, are sent into outer darkness and slain, verse 26 and 27. But the faithful servants who suffered with Christ and were faithful, have authority over C-I-T-I-E-S cities. Luke 19, 17. Luke 19, 19. Now this should erase all shadow of a doubt in anybody's mind as to the nature of the millennial reign. There is something, certainly nothing spiritual about it. The people who are given authority are given authority over cities on this earth when Christ returns and puts his feet on the ground. Nothing could be any clearer, nothing could be any plainer, and the gross, crass spiritism of the allegorizing, figurativizing, Bible-rejecting scholars which deny a physical literal reign is very typical of Bible-rejecting infidels. Now, the greatest criticism brought against the premillennialist is that he's a gross, crass materialist. But strangely enough, this charge is always brought by men who think they are reigning now. And instead of carrying their crosses, they're trying to wear their crown in this dispensation. It is one of the paradoxes of the Almighty to confound a man and slap the words back in his mouth. And the most gross, carnal materialists in this age are the ones who are not looking forward for Christ coming to set up a literal kingdom. As a matter of fact, 
the greatest materialists in this age are the ones who don't believe he's ever coming back to set up a kingdom. So they are doing it themselves. That's how the Lord makes fools out of people. The spiritual people in this age, as in any age, are the people who are trying to win people to Christ to hasten the return of the Lord so the literal, political, visible kingdom can be set up. But this is very typical of the confusion that people get into when they try to alter the Word of God and make it suit their own fancy. The everlasting fable that the Jew rejected Christ because he was looking for a visible kingdom when Christ came to bring a spiritual kingdom should be classed with uh, Alice in Wonderland, Aesop's Fables, Charlie Peanut, uh, Brown, and Lil Abner. Uh, every Jew had a perfect right to expect a literal kingdom to come, and when the d disciples said that Jesus will about this time restore again the kingdom of Israel, he didn't deny that he would. All he said was, it isn't time yet, you don't know the times, get busy. Christ never denied there'd be a literal kingdom restored to Israel. Why, when he was born, the angel said to Mary, the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. Not God's throne, David's throne. And the angel said to Mary, He shall reign over the house of Jacob. Not the church, not the spiritual Israel, not the Israel of God. Jacob, brother, the old circumcised son of Abraham and Isaac. All right, the millennium takes place. We read in verse 5, The rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. They are kings and priests. They are said to be priests, and they are said to reign. Therefore they are kings and priests. And there's not much doubt about the literalness of this passage. For Revelation 5.10 says, Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign, not in heaven, not in the kingdom of God. We shall reign on the E-A-R-T-H, earth. And now you see where Judge Rutherford and Russell got off. They thought the tribulation was now taking place, and since the Bible said they'd reign on earth, they figured they'd just endure and last through the tribulation and come out in the millennium. <laughs> and they might at that. The only trouble is the Antichrist is going to show up in the meantime, and... You're going to have to get that mark. 144,000 were marked. How are you going to tell one mark from another, brother? If I were you, I'd put that watchtower down and pick up a Bible. All right, this is the great and glorious reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. With the second advent of the true king, the king of righteousness, five things take place that science has been trying to bring in for 3,000 years. First of all, the physical surface of the earth is regenerated. The earth is literally born again. Matthew 19, 28, Acts 3, 20 to 21. Animal nature is liberated from the curse, and nature itself grows four crops a year while all the animals live in perfect, peaceful integration. Romans 8, 18 to 25, Isaiah 11, 1 to 11, Amos 9, 13, Isaiah 55, 12, Isaiah 30, 23, Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, Joel 2, 19 and 24, Ezekiel 34, 25 to 26, Ezekiel 36, 29. You see, the one who created creatures and who nurtured nature certainly has no trouble in making them obey him. Next, the Gentile world powers are obliterated, and the armies and navies of America, Europe, Asia, and Africa are demolished. See Daniel 2, Micah 4, 3, Isaiah 2, 4, Revelation 2.27, Revelation 11.15, Revelation 12.5, and Revelation 19.15. The Christians who suffered in this age and went outside the camp bearing his reproach come into their inheritance as heirs. 2 Timothy 2.12, Romans 8.17. And they inherit a spiritual moral kingdom of righteousness, 1 Corinthians 6.9, Galatians 5.21. Israel, as in Solomon's time, now becomes the chief and head of the nations, and the world capital becomes the holy, righteous Jerusalem with a sinless Savior as king. Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, Isaiah 63 to 67, Hosea 2, 14 to 23. And the Jew inherits the kingdom of heaven in answer to his prayer of Matthew 6, 10. 
what summit conferences, League of Nations, five-year plans, heart funds, Salvation Armies, YMCA's Catholic Welfare, Socialized Medicine, Medicare, Atomic Energy, Positive Thinking, the FBI, Military Conscription, Truces and Law Courts could not attain in 2,000 years of church history the Lord Jesus Christ accomplishes at once the day he lands on this earth. And vanished is all the glory of this world with all its heroes. And gone from the memory of mankind are the deeds and pageants of its great men. For in view of the results of this kingdom which now comes, the world's leaders are proved to be what they really were all along, cheap humanitarian hucksters, with nothing more in mind than proving their own righteousness or trying to atone for their own sins with the filthy rags of their own good works. The Jew gets put back in the lead, head of the nations. The one true holy apostolic Catholic Church is annihilated along with its corrupt Vatican politics, and the Christian receives the reward for his own good works, having obtained the gift of God's grace by unmerited, undeserved, unearned eternal life. And with these three groups properly placed, the Christian, the Jew, and Rome, peace comes at last for 1,000 years, the longest period in human history. I don't know whether you know it or not, but 15 wars have been fought since the turn of the century, and the two biggest and three biggest are yet ahead, as I said a little while back. And it's the first time in the history of mankind there's been peace for this long a time. Women can sleep without worrying about having to pack their household belongings and lugging their children away from the path of an approaching army. The 88, the 105, the 155, 205, and 20 millimeter shells, and the heavy and light mortar shells rust in the ordnance depots. The bows and arrows rot in the rain. The 38s, 45s, 30 sixes, 30 30s, 380s, and 7 millimeters gather dust in the drawers and the gun racks while men talk about the king of Jerusalem who had been given all power in heaven, kingdom of God, and on earth, kingdom of heaven. Now he says, the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This clearly shows you that there are two resurrections. These two resurrections are called the resurrection of the quick and the resurrection of the dead in 1 Peter. Paul speaks about them in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. And of course, Daniel speaks of them when he speaks about the dead and those that are sleeping in the dust, awakening. And when they awake, they come up at two different times, separated by a thousand years. Hence, Daniel says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, first resurrection, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, second resurrection. Now, once again, the man who is post-millennial or amillennial cannot discern between the two resurrections. For if a man is a post-millennialist and believes that we're bringing in the kingdom, he has a thousand years of perfect peace on this earth, and then Christ returns to one general resurrection and one general judgment. If a man is an amillennialist, he believes things get worse and worse until Christ comes back, and then there's one general resurrection with one general judgment. Now, of course, this destroys two-thirds of the Bible. If there's anything the Bible is clear on, it's clear that on the fact that Jesus Christ arose from the dead. And if you read the passages in Mark, Luke, and Matthew in the book of Acts, you'll find the thing that puzzled the disciples was Christ speaking about rising from the dead. The Pharisees and Sadducees were grieved in the book of Acts because the disciples spoke of the resurrection from the dead. Nobody had any objection to a resurrection. Paul says in his defense before Agrippa that the Pharisees uh, all agreed there'd be a resurrection from the dead or of the dead. And he said that uh, that was the hope of Israel, a resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. But uh, a Pharisee didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead. As a matter of fact, the resurrection from the dead was unheard of until Christ rose from the dead. And when the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned it to his disciples, they had a great disputation among themselves as to what these things should mean. Everybody understood there'd be a general resurrection, and a general rising from of the dead at the last day. But in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, when Christ said, 
tell no man what things you've seen till the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Mark says they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one with another what the rising from the dead should mean. You see, unsaved people don't know there are two resurrections, and their rejection of the doctrine of the two resurrections shows that consciously or subconsciously they have rejected Christ as Savior. For when Christ arose, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says a half a dozen times he arose from the dead, from the dead, from the dead. His resurrection from the dead shows that you can be resurrected before the dead come up. And this was the bone of contention between Martha and Mary at the death of Lazarus. If you remember, Martha was troubled about with many things and cumbered with much serving, and she never did get her doctrine straightened out. And she said, Lord, I know that he'll rise again at the last day, speaking of a general resurrection and a general judgment. And Christ had to correct her and bring her into line with the premillennial biblical teaching of Bible-believing fundamentalists. When he told Martha, he said, I am the resurrection. Don't you see what he was telling her? She said, I know my brother's coming up at the last day. And he said, Martha, you haven't got that right. If you'd spent as much time studying your Bible as you'd spent studying A.T. Robertson and J. Gresham Mockin and Warfield and other dead Orthodox conservatives, you'd know perfectly well your brother's not going to come up at the last day. Because if a man believes on me, he's coming up before the last day. Did Jesus Christ come up at the last judgment? Did Jesus Christ come up at the general resurrection? Well, if he rose from the dead, and he's your Savior, and the Spirit that raised him from the dead dwelleth in your mortal bodies, Romans chapter 8, what is to prevent you from coming up before the last resurrection of the unsaved dead? Nothing. Brother, you're coming up. Paul said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be chained in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. The resurrection from the dead is the first resurrection. And as we have noted earlier in our comments on Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the first resurrection is not over until Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. This is why he said, this is the first resurrection. And if you will review our remarks on Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, you will notice that one man was delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh because he taught the first resurrection was spiritual. And, of course, this is the teaching of the majority of dead Orthodox apostates in America today. They teach the first resurrection is the one of Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. But this is plainly the spiritual resurrection of the believer. What we are dealing with here is a literal resurrection. Notice the context. Those who were beheaded lived and reigned with Christ. There is no reference to a spiritually dead sinner being quickened by the Holy Spirit and reigning with Christ in the kingdom of God. Why, that's nonsense. These people had their heads cut off and they came back up out of the grave and lived again and sat out on thrones and that completed the first resurrection. The first resurrection has three parts to it, as we've said before marked by the three feasts of Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. These three parts are the first fruits, Old Testament saints, Ephesians 4, Matthew 27, church age saints, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, gleanings or tribulation saints, Matthew 24, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 14. Now we've discussed these matters before in our comments on the expression, come up hither, found in Revelation chapter 4, and the sincere student of truth who desires the truth should review these remarks if he can obtain the volumes. In closing our exposition of our passage on this side of our volume, Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, we note the Holy Spirit has said, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death, mentioned in verse 14, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. 
Then if a man is in the first resurrection, he doesn't have to worry about the second one. A man in the second resurrection has to worry about whether or not his name is in the book of life. Those in the first resurrection don't have to even examine it. Paul said, Your names are written in heaven, Philippians chapter 4. Christ said, They're written in heaven, Luke chapter 10. And these names written in heaven of saved people in this age refer to people who are just like Jesus Christ at the rapture, Ephesians chapter 5, Philippians chapter 2, 1 John chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And these people have already reigned on this earth as Christ a thousand years before the last general resurrection of the unsaved dead takes place. They have no more a fear of going to hell at the last judgment than a full-grown man should be afraid of a penny balloon. John said, Perfect love casteth out fear, for fear hath torment. He that feareth hath not made perfect in love. Here may we have boldness in the day of judgment, for as he is, so are we in this world. And by the time we reign with Jesus Christ on this earth for a thousand years, the second resurrection will be nothing to us but a chance to judge with Christ, Daniel chapter 7. You will notice in that passage in Daniel chapter 7 that while thousands are standing before the fiery throne to be judged, there are thousands and thousands judging with Christ. This doctrine is confirmed also in the New Testament, where we read in 1 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, that the saints shall judge angels. Furthermore, Paul says what? Know ye not that ye shall judge the world? In other words, the Christian at the white throne judgment has already been a perfect replica of Jesus Christ, conformed to his image, Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to 30, for more than a thousand years, and his official capacity at that time will be of a joint judge with Christ of the world and fallen angels. Now, we'll get into that more as we study on through Revelation chapter 20, and especially when we deal with the events that take place at the White Throne Judgment, the last judgment of the unsaved dead, which is the general resurrection and general judgment that you hear of spoken of so much by the dead Orthodox commentators. Suffice it at this time to note that if you're saved and a child of God, you do not come up at the last resurrection on the day of judgment. You come up at least 1,000 years before this time, and you come up in time to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and attend the marriage of the Lamb before the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ begins. Therefore, at a minimum, I say at a minimum, there are a 1,000 years between your rapture and the white throne judgment. The maximum is not given. For the rapture could be this instant while I'm talking, there is a chance that I might not ever finish these volumes and our study in Revelation. There is a chance before I get to our next volume, volume 14, the Lord may come, and this may be the last volume in which you'll ever hear my voice. The maximum time is not given. We know that Daniel's 70th week intervenes between the rapture and the millennium but we do not know the measurement of time that intervenes between the rapture and Daniel's 70th week. Therefore, the rapture is always imminent. No matter how long the advent may be delayed or timed, the rapture is imminent and can occur at any time. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. I hope when he comes back, you'll be caught up with him to meet your loved ones in the air, in the clouds going up, and I hope you'll experience the joyful and blessed fulfillment of that verse that says, I am the resurrection. He that liveth and believeth on me shall never die, referring to the saint who's alive when he comes. And though he were dead, yet shall he live. How? Easy. He's resurrected from the dead, exactly as Jesus Christ arose from the dead the third day. We'll continue our study of Revelation chapter 20 in our next volume, which will be volume 14.